six years, how many people have been fired or prosecuted for corrupt activity in government? Especially in the last six months. Okay, you know what? This is our good... And I, and I, I, I put that in the context of the United States, where since President Obama came into office five years ago, there have been 6,000 people at the local, state, and federal level that have been prosecuted and convicted for corrupt activity in government offices. 6,000 people, including last week, the governor of the state of Virginia and his wife were convicted on 16 counts uh, for taking money in return for favors. Yeah, Katya? Okay, so first of all, we know that that's because the U.S. is much more corrupt than Ukraine, right? Um, so, uh, uh, Katya Gurchinskaya, she's the deputy editor of KU Post. Yeah, actually, interestingly, as a, as a part of preparation for this panel, I read a government report that gave me some figures that, that were actually quite striking, and one of them was a sort of an answer to your question, except uh, I have the figures for 2011-2013, and it was a total of four people yeah. at the highest level. And just to, to hammer the point home uh, about the scale of corruption happening around the same time, um, when the current government came into place, Prime Minister Yatsenyuk said that According to their estimates, the previous government, at the highest level, stole about 70 billion worth of wealth from Ukraine. And that was the original estimate. Since then, it's been growing. It's now 120 or something like that. And that's about, you know, Ukraine's budget this year is about 30 billion. So that gives you the scale of corruption. And in the same report, actually, this, they said that, um, you know, things didn't improve much this year, but there are no statistics yet. So, Katyu, how is it going? You're one of the watch since we're starting to... You're one of the watchdogs. Your job is to keep these guys honest. Are, are they actually making any progress at all or just getting better at talking about it? Well, they're, they're, they're making some progress, yeah, but um, only nominally. I mean, uh, Prime Minister Yatsenyuk, for example, although he acknowledged that they completely failed anti-corruption fight, they, he, was, he was pointing out some of the things that they have achieved. For example, uh, in deregulation, when, they, when he said they killed half of the inspections. But he forgot to mention that in absolute terms, we still have like 83 or 84 of them in Ukraine, and, which is ridiculous. And, and it's like that every step of the way. I mean, even if, if tenders... Uh, public procurement tenders were opened up, made m more free. There's still, the estimate is still, uh, you know, there's 30 percent. Uh, it's just a slight improvement. And it's uh, the level of kickbacks went down from 50 to 30 percent, for example, or according to some estimates to 20 percent, uh, which is still pretty corrupt uh, any way you look at it. So it's not very impressive. And basically, the, the, the problem is, and, and Pavlo said the same thing, gave you the same messages roughly in, in different terms. So there are basically three elements to uh, fighting corruption, and, and it's leadership, policy, and institutions. And we have failed to make major changes in all three of these areas. We do lack leadership a great deal um, at the top of the government. And in fact, a lot of the time, this, this leadership role is taken by civil society groups, the likes of Anti-Corruption Action Center uh, and other pro-reform uh, groups like, like uh, the Reanimation of Reform, who are basically driving the agenda. They're suggesting draft legislation. Is there anything wrong with that? I mean, they're probably better at suggesting legislation than the government. There's nothing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that uh, as long as they just suggest as opposed to do the, the government's job because that by no means do they have the resources um, to be able to, to do it on the long, to, to take the long run on it, which is, which is needed in Ukraine. Is it going to get better after the parliamentary election? Well, Vitaly's running, so hopefully it'll get better, yeah. And he's not the only one, because a lot of people who are a part of this, this younger generation who are really trying are running. But unfortunately, you need a critical mass in the government to be able to, to, turn, to turn the tide, um, because Pavlo has tried to do it on his own, and, and uh, like he said, he kind of failed, uh, because you have to thwart the system, and the system works in extremely strange and twisted ways. Um, I'll just give you one example. When, when I, I had a conversation with, um, with prosecutors from the general prosecutor's office, and they were explaining to me one of the reasons why some of the Maidan-related cri crimes were not, have not been punished. And they're saying every time we, we, um, we have a procedural issue with uh, the uh, Pichera's court, and that's the court that sanctions um, things like arrest warrants for the general prosecutor, um, they don't accept our applications. They just turn them, turn them back and say, nope, we're not taking them. 
Why is that? Because we have instructions. Or alternatively, when they, when they do file for arrest warrants, the person who is supposed to be arrested just disappears overnight. And there are many signs like that, and, you know, that, that the, the, until the, the legislature changes, until there are major changes in the prosecutor's office, until the institutional strength is built, um, we're not going to move very fast. And, I mean, the, the very fact that the anti-corruption um, bureau is being stalled so uh, aggressively um, is a sign of how bad and how per pervasive the corruption is. Okay. Um, We've uh, heard a few times now about uh, Vitaly's fine work and his political promise. So Vitaly is the chairman of the board of the Anti-Corruption Action Center. He's been working with Pavla on laws. He's running for parliament. I can give you some campaign tips afterwards if you want. Um, Vitaly, скажите нам в першу чергу, що гальмує Україну? Could you please tell us, Vitaly, what? Uh is a hindrance to Ukraine and uh, why do you think uh, that uh, in the parliament you will manage to do more? Who would uh, overcome the corruption in Ukraine? And with all respect to our international guests and partners, even in this room there are many Ukrainians that whose impact on this fight could be crucial and I will really wait them to make it impact more and bigger. Um, yeah, продолжу. I will speak Ukrainian, so if anyone needs earphones, should just use it. Дуже um, коротко. So, I'll be brief. Uh, we in the civic sector like and use uh, figures. In fact, uh, all of our victories were the victories of a very professional team. Uh, over the last uh, six months, we monitored the performance of the Ukrainian Financial Intelligence Unit. And over these last six months, uh, this uh, agency handed over to the law enforcement authorities information about suspicious transactions of 133 billion hryvnias in the course of the recent six months. In the course of uh, pre-trial investigation, 870 million hryvnias were arrested, uh, but only 26 million were returned to the state upon judicial proceedings, and the factual returned some with only 360,000. And these figures are more eloquent than any political statements. Big corruption existed in Ukraine, and it remains in Ukraine the most profitable business. Changing this is possible only if there is uh, the political will. Pablo Sheremeta is absolutely correct. It is clearly seen what has to be done. You don't have to invent anything. A legal arrangement uh, is something to fight. Uh, but very often the criminal proceedings are against persons who are not physically available in Ukraine and it's impossible to hold them liable. You know, there is always a motto, like, corruption always has a name to it. It's not something ephemeral. Uh, there is always somebody's signature or an absence of one under any uh, corruption deal. Uh, somebody said that it is in the that it's the Parliament of Ukraine that it is in the way of reforms. Uh, the law on the uh, transparency of property registers, which can eradicate a raiding, uh, failed uh, as a project uh, because of the position of the political parties that formed the government. The same may be said about the law uh, on proceedings in absentia, which is what we really need in order to confiscate the assets of the representatives of the uh, previous administrations. And I really fail to understand why foreign institutions are still giving money to the Ukrainian authorities. I am as said. You'll get the tranche if by September 1st the law on the National Anti-Corruption Bureau with its provision on unlawful enrichment is registered in the Parliament. Not voted for, but just registered. Then on the 3rd of September 
the draft is not registered, but the uh, fund uh, comes up with a tranche. Uh, would it be better if IMF did not give the money? While we were speaking with Pavlo about uh, public procurement uh, laws, this law was passed only because IMF said that it would give the money only when and if the law is voted for, and that's why the law was voted for. Uh, so when uh, the West is giving uh, money to us Ukrainians and Ukraine fails to meet the conditions, all that uh, gives the light to the possibility of anti-corruption reforms in Ukraine, and I think that would be all right now. Oh, no, one more thing. If we uh, get away from the level of legislation to the level of implementation, uh, all of the assets of the members of the former administration that are frozen abroad will be unfrozen real soon if the prosecutor general's office doesn't start resorting to elementary procedural actions. We draft laws. We beg parliament members to s and gov the government to submit them to the parliament. We bring journalists to the investigators and ask those investigators to take depositions or evidence from these journalists. Uh, and we are really doing whatever we can, but if Kluivs and Zaharchenkos and others' accounts are unfrozen in the West, that uh, will also have a signature beneath, a signature of the official who failed to perform his duties. Thank you, Natalia. I have one additional question to you. Why do you think that... Uh, going for the parliament, uh, you'll change anything, and the election, at, by and large, will have uh, something uh, to change. I'll go on the first uh, day as an MP to the Ministry of Defense and see the uh, military contract under the two zeros. So that will be the first thing, because I cannot get access. I'm, I have no clearance, and I know what is in the documents. So when they said that the Ukrainian army I uh, have no money. I would like to take off my shoe and uh, hit somebody on the head. We are a very rich country with uh, lots of resources, but the majority of such resources are being embezzled. And uh, all of us know uh, what is going on. There's no scheme that is not known to the um, uh, powerful people. There's no just political will. Where there's a will, there's a way. There was skepticism about whether Ukraine will be able to tackle these problems. And I said, yes, there is a skepticism in Washington, the same skepticism that is in Europe, and the same skepticism that Ukrainian people are expressing every day. There's a lot of skepticism. But let me say at the same time that there's a lot of resources available to s solve this problem. Uh, all the brilliant young people and the researchers and the advocates and the journalists uh, and some of the politicians who are committed to solving this problem. So Ukraine has all that it needs to solve this problem, and it has friends. The United States is trying to help. Uh, we've met just in the last couple of days with officials in the Prosecutor General's office and the Ministry of Justice. Uh, my colleagues from USAID and from the, our Department of Justice are on the ground here providing all kinds of assistance to help build the systems. But in the end, it's not up to us. It's going to be up to the Ukrainians in public office to take the steps necessary. Okay, Katya wants to jump in, and then we'll throw it open to questions. I see a lot of people want to talk. I was actually going to make a point that the West can, can do a lot more for Ukraine than, than what has already been mentioned, because Vitaly mentioned that you have to give us clear, clear benchmarks and make sure that they're observed. And in a way, the, the international organizations are doing that. At the last review, for example, the International Monetary Fund in the, this, earlier this month rolled out eight benchmarks of them about five are to do with corruption. So you guys have to make sure that, <laughs> that they, they, the government meets those benchmarks before and ro rolling out the next tranche. Um, also, obviously, the resources are very helpful. But at the same time, there's, there's another great way that, to help us. Um, by cleaning their own house, 
for Western countries. Because, I mean, as a part of Yanukovych Leaks team that uh, analyzed documents that we fished out at Mezhigiria uh, about the corrupt activities of the previous president and his properties and, and transactions and things like that. And, and basically, just about any journalistic investigation where there is a, a corrupt transaction of any sort features, uh, at the end of the day, you, will, you come across a wall of, or a whole web of companies and offshore destinations that are covered by international law and are impossible to penetrate. Uh, and this is where the corrupt, corrupt officials in Ukraine actually hide their wealth, hide their properties, and, and hide behind a wall of, you know, they, they become beneficiary owners, but you can't dig down to, to that ownership. You can never prove officially or punish them that, that they're behind the, the, the wall. Um, and this is something in, in a part of the international law that needs revision because a lot of those companies and uh, transactions just do not get scrutinized at all, ever. Okay. Um, so I don't know whether to feel sorry for the IMF or to feel like it's great to be the IMF in Ukraine because Anders Ostlund has said you're too soft. Ukrainians say don't give them money. It's an uncommon feeling, right? Okay. So now we'll start questions. Pan Anatoly Hrycenko. Thank you very much. I could represent myself differently, but now as a head of the parliamentary subcommittee on preventing money laundering, and as a head of the political party that gave Vitaly a seat number five in the parliamentary list, and some other people who are not members of our party, they must be, because they used to fight corruption in an NGO sector quite strongly. Uh, the question is, foreign dimension of fighting corruption in Ukraine. We are not asking to help us. We rather ask to obey their own anti-corruption legislation. Just two examples. First, 2012, Yanukovych is in power. He is member of government, Mr. Kluyev. Journalists, NGO leaders disclose all the bank accounts in Austrian bank. Under the threat, in fact, could be killed. We have written, together with Vitaly and two other people, uh, a letter with all the proofs to the Austrian law enforcement structures and to the bank to freeze, because they are perhaps politically exposed person. It's clear it's corruption. All the proof, zero result. Second, maybe you can, if you wish, a bit uh, react. You know, there are well-known in the world companies, Chevron and Shell. Both contracted here for the shale gas extraction. Sharing of product agreements. And our Ukrainian NGOs in anti-corruption sphere, journalists, also risking, they presented before signing the document, there is 10% share of the Yanukovych fam family in each of those two contracts. By the way, they were signed. Moreover, it's already seven months when Yanukovych is out. Still, 10% of the share is still within Chevron versus Ukrainian government and Shell, Dutch and British. Guys, you should obey anti-corruption legislation, A, and B, listen to the voices with the proof here from inside the country. Don't help us. Thank you. Okay, Tom, that's for you. Well, I mean, I, I accept the larger point that both Katya and you make, that the Western countries are, are to some notable extent complicit in enabling corruption in Ukraine and other countries, because a lot of the corrupt money ends up in real estate and uh, vacations and universities for children in the Western countries. Um, and so, in a passive but knowing way, I think there's a lot of responsibility that's been shared. Um, I also want to tell you that what you've seen in the building out of the sanctions against Russia uh, in response to the uh, 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 invasion of Crimea um, is built in part around the corrupt networks in Russia that extend into Crimea. So we're beginning to build out uh, in our system more knowledge about where the illicit uh, enrichment comes from and where it goes. Um, we don't 
investigate everybody that opens a bank account in the United States or Britain. You know, we don't, it's not, we don't start with a premise that we, we should be investigating everybody that buys real estate. So what we will act on, though, is information that comes from, you know, other sources. And so that's where the increasing professionalism of journalism and of uh, watchdog organizations and hopefully before too long law enforcement agencies in places like Ukraine so we can work together to uh, intercept and capture some of that illicit wealth. So we're ready to do more of that. I accept the point that we haven't done enough of that, even uh, consistent with our own Foreign Corrupt Practices Act perhaps. But we'd be glad to take on any information that people make available and consider it on, on its merits. Okay, I think Vital, you wanted to add something. I would like to support um, Anatoly Hretsenko. We begged the international community, especially European, to do this before uh, the Heavenly Hundred appeared in Ukraine. And um, I will. Uh, uh, make my argument against you. You check all the people who open banking accounts in the U.S. And the and FinCEN, they know that Austria knew that Kluyev uh, was a politically exposed person, but they didn't check the assets, whether they were lawful. We need to kill 100 persons before Austria starts uh, with its own legislation. Ukraine had to lose the Crimea to really make Europe alerts about Gazprom and the affiliated structures spring their roots into your ground. And they will already violated and destructed your European, your Western freedoms. Uh, rotten money from uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Ukraine, and in the U.S., they will also um, disrupt your basic institutions. Um, situation with Ukraine made it um, visible, exposed it, and our people during the Dignity Revolution told me, Italy, you displayed everything, uh, uncovered uh, all the uh, clues, uh, accounts and assets. Why wouldn't Austrians block such accounts? Why would we aspire for Europe, die for Europe? Europe that does not comply with its own laws. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we'll hear from European here. The European voice very poor, as you see. Uh, <laughs> But uh, uh, I, I follow this uh, discussion and I have, I have some problem because I, I see that you are focused how to punish people uh, whom you don't like and uh, whom, uh, the people who have money. Uh, I think that somebody has money, this is money from corruption and I would like to punish him blocking his account in Austria, for example. Okay, maybe this is, this is uh, one of the tracks, but I want to give you a good, good advice. If you want to really fight with corruption, you should start from the beginning. What is the beginning? The beginning is relation between politics and money. If you don't have efficient uh, law, which is organizing, financing campaign and financing political parties, you are never successful. Believe me. In Poland, we had this story about 15 years ago or 20 years ago. And as long as we didn't have a very strict very strict regulation how to limit and control the expenses and how the money cannot create political career, you, are, you will be never successful. Thank you. Okay, since that was a comment rather than a question, I'm going to go straight to Pat Cox here. No, it was good, it was good. But we'll just get another question here. Here, Pat Cox. Thank you. It's a, it's a, this is a very sobering session to, to, to listen to. Many years ago, I used work on a television investigative current affairs program. And if I heard someone like Pablo telling the story about the company he tried to close four times and telling eventually he discovered partly he can't close it because two parties want to make some money for the election, my investigation team straight away would want to talk to him and all the other people to expose the two parties. I'm not asking you to do what you don't want to do, but I'm asking the more general question. If these things are known, and this is now publicly said, how will this be outed? Who will do it? And who will follow up? 
because these people could be in the next government. And if they're already starting a journey through gross corruption on the way in, how can they be the saving angels of Ukraine on the way out? Well, I see at least uh, two agencies that uh, have to deal with that. Number one is the General Prosecutor's Office. Number two is media, as you mentioned. And uh, I think that many people and many businesses will be probably happy to give uh, a lot of information about this and some other companies too. Okay. Um, Prosho. Oleg Makarov, uh, juridic firma Vasil Kisil Partneri. I'm Oleg Makarov from Vasil Kisil and Partners Law Firm. I have a question about corruption in courts. Do you know uh, that uh, of the presidents of local courts uh, were the managers of corruption in courts and that they agreed on their rulings with uh, Yanukovych's uh, team and then the uh, law on uh, illustration was drafted but uh, and it was decided to appoint presidents of course in a different way by way of election do you know that 70 percent of the presidents of the course who were appointed by Yanukovych were elected by secret vote to their positions again how can we fight corruption in courts then and another question is for all speakers what is more important now uh, to fight uh, those who were taking uh, bribes uh, under the old power or to fight those corrupt people who got the power with the new authorities as for the law you mentioned, there was something wrong about it from the very beginning, and our organization was against it. We were saying that the system would re-elect the same uh, presidents of courts. Uh, it was evident that the judges would vote for the same presidents. As for the reform of the judicial system, we really have to annihilate the old system and to build a new one from you. Then a Victoria's Pechersky court is uh, blocking all cases uh, of the prosecutor general's office. Even if the prosecutors want to do anything, the judges of the Pechersky court uh, uh, don't allow them to. Uh, uh, well, whether to fight uh, corruption uh, in the past or corruption in the future, I'll refer to our Polish uh, colleague. The key to countering corruption in Ukraine is um, uh, punishment. Uh, that cannot be averted. Whatever laws we write, there will always be attempts to bypass them. But all attempts to bypass laws should be punished. Otherwise, laws will have no sense. So we are to begin with liability for corruption-related offenses, and then come the reforms of the assets registers, etc. Uh, even if online we show the transactions of the political parties, we won't be able to trace down uh, payments in cash. Uh, anyhow, cash changes hands. And the crucial thing to begin with is to uh, ensure that all are brought to uh, liability as the law requires all in a row, and then we'll have our final round of answers because our time is running out. Uh, Daniel Bilek, I'm a managing partner of an international law firm. I've been here 23 years, 10 of which was spent inside the Ukrainian government, and I've come to the following penetrating glimpse into the obvious, that to fight corruption, you need to shine light in dark corners. And the darkest corners in this country are the institutional problems. The Verkhovna Rada, the, executive, the uh, legislative branch, the executive in the structure of government, in the need for public administration reform, and as my colleague uh, Oleg Makarov said, judiciary. Uh, Vitali, I, uh, I have a challenge. It's great that the Maidan has thrown up. We work together with you in, in a working group at a conference. You are a, certainly a bright light and a, uh, uh, a tremendous asset to this country, and, and I'm sure you will be to the Verkhovna Rada. 
I am very concerned that all the bright lights from the Maidan are being now swept into the, uh, parliamentary, into the parliamentary system. On the one hand, that's great. On the other hand, who's going to control you? And who's going to control the temptations that you will be uh, subject to, especially as a deputy? So, I have a challenge to yourself, to Hannah Hopko, to Svetlana Zalishchuk, and to all of the bright lights of the Maidan. On the first day of the Verkhona Rada, that the three of you stand up and you put a Zakona project, the draft law, before the parliament to cancel your parliamentary immunity. Thank you very much. Okay, and we'll take question there and then question here. Nie, 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 nie. Si skazuj svoje pitanje tudi ostatnje vidpuj, okay? Uh, my name is Frederick Svinovitov. I'm the former director of Tata Pak in Ukraine and also the former president of EBA. Um, I have been fighting Uke Komrisus for 10 years in my capacity at Tata Pak. And um, what I see now, I live in Kachoka in the south of Ukraine, is that the candidates that are candidating for positions in the, not only the Rada but also the governors are actually very, very unsuitable. And this is so obvious in the new uh, situation we are now. I'm going to actually personally, in my constituency, drive this because I'm the biggest taxpayer and this is my money going to the wrong people. Uh, so we're going to do it through international press, whatever it takes to expose Ukraine uh, today. And that's going to hurt Ukraine if Ukraine don't uh, address these things. I'm Swedish. Uh, we're also corrupted, but the corruption is a small exception in our country. Um, Ukrainian people are no worse than Swedish people, and they're not better, or Spanish, or German, but the system, the system forms the people, and people are acting according to the system. So I think we have to really go to the institutions, we said, and we have, this is where we have to put the system in place. Then everything will step by step sort itself out. And I don't know if it is possible to copy any country. It, it, it must not be able to reinvent the system for prevention of corruption. This is what I would like to, I'd like to see. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that comment. And then a final question right here from this gentleman. I, I will be short. My name is Gela Bezrashvili. I'm from Georgia. And I was part of the government that fought corruption for the last 10 years. And we made a significant progress, proudly say. Uh, I'm not here to give advices or teach. These are talented people. They know what to do. What I am suggesting that this is possible only when there is a collective effort, when the president on the top, when the prime minister is in, when each minister is responsible, uh, when you have a motivated members of parliament working as a team. So nothing new for you. But I'm here to show you that it is possible you can do it. And that's, that's my message. But one thing I need to tell you that uh, you mentioned the law and you, uh, you mentioned the agency that you are going to create. Uh, there was a debate in Georgia and we decided not to make another bureaucracy and create a scapegoat. Because that agency will be at some point a scapegoat for unsuccessful fight about corruption. So make it a collective effort the responsibility of the presidency, responsibility of the new government, and you will be successful. So good luck. Okay, that's actually a great final comment. Good to have one cheering thought in this quite bleak conversation. I'm going to give each panelist a chance to make a final comment. You can either respond to these questions, or if you have a burning thing you want to say, please do, but just a couple of sentences, and we'll go in reverse order from our speaking order. So we'll start with Vitali. <laughs> I will repeat what I said in the beginning. As for immunity, no problem with that. We'll do it. But it would be wise if not uh, Zelishuk, Hopko, and myself do that, but if the heads of the factions sign that. 
and you will ask me about the outcome. A submitting a draft law is not an outcome, it's an imitation of an outcome. Passage of the law is an outcome. For example, the Prime Minister said we failed the anti-corruption reform. I can prompt him as to how to gain a real success in two days. Just take your mobile phone, dial the speaker, and ask the member of your party to register the draft that was developed in the Cabinet of Ministers, the law of the Anti-Corruption Bureau. That is doable just by one phone call. Corruption always has its name. This is what I will repeat again. The, P, the key to fighting corruption in Ukraine is uh, uh, criminal liability of those who are personally responsible for corruption-related crimes. Everything else will be consensus. The true words with, with one stone. A, you will provide uh, expertise and increase institutional capacity for the parliament, for the parliament member, and become the, uh, the watchdog for a new parliament member. And, uh, you know, that will address both of your concerns. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's a good idea. It could be a new objective of the yes meetings to have at least five draft laws come out of every conference. No, my other point was that just about everyone who was speaking here, including in the audience, was making a point about institutional strength. That is obviously something that Ukraine is, is missing very terribly, and that's something somewhere where, where the, you know, the new leadership will have to, to, to go in that direction. And, and I think that this is probably going to, be, going to have to be the focus of our, our attention for the next few years to come. Okay, public? In brief, um... There's only one reason for any kind of success, and that is we really badly wanted it. Uh, we, uh, Georgians wanted it, Polish wanted it, we wanted it when we got rid of Yanukovych and his clique, but uh, there's, by default there is only one reason for failure then, and it's not the war, it's not Putin, we just did not want it badly enough. That's the only reason we can accept. Thank you. Or maybe not all of us. Okay, Tom, last word is yours. Um, on behalf of uh, the large and growing number of uh, friends of Ukraine in the international community, and you see them, they come back to this conference and every other opportunity to come back to Ukraine time and again. You know, every former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine keeps coming back because they're all seduced into thinking that it could, it could happen. Could happen. <laughs> and what you see in the con continuing international interest and support for Ukraine is the classic triumph of hope over experience. <laughs> Someday our hopes will come true. The question is whether it will be this time. Okay, I'm going to say it will be this time. It has to be this time. And thank you to a wonderful panel, incredibly passionate and well-informed. You've said worrying things, but actually you've left me hopeful because of your passion and your knowledge. So thanks a lot.